without further ado, we will get started. So let me share my screen really quickly. Okay. All right, so let's get to the beginning. So we are going to be talking about, as we see here, basic geography terms and from a physical geography standpoint. So our first term here is a long one, so archipelago. Um, so an archipelago is a group of islands. So many people, when they think of islands or um, groups of islands, because many places around the world don't, um, there's many examples where there's not just an island in isolation. There are maybe several islands. So islands and the Baller, the Baller Eric, the Baller Eric Islands, sorry, and those are both um, Spanish archipelagos, but there are also many more around the earth. So some other examples that you might think of, um, the Bahamas, that's a very large archipelago. Um, also the Philippines, that is a very large archipelago with um, hundreds of islands. Same thing with the, with the Bahamas, there are um, hundreds of islands there, very small, some are larger, um, but those are some of the, the biggest archipelagos around the world. All right, secondly, well, and these are in alphabetical order, so as we go, we'll, we'll just go through the alphabet. But um, secondly is bay. So a bay is a pretty common term that I think most people have heard, and it is a body of water that is partially enclosed by land. So it usually is kind of like a U-shape, almost like a C, where you have mostly land surrounding the bay, and there's um, an area where you can get into the bay. So current, um, there are many bays out there. Um, the Bay of Banderas, which is where I was previously before today, that um, is in Mexico. It's a bay where Puerto Vallarta sits. Um, we have here the Bay of Biscay, which is a bay um, near Spain. Um, the Bay of Bengal is a is a, is a, another big bay uh, in the world. So um, several examples of bays here. And here we'll just have um, a couple of examples here on the screen. So we see Cape Cod Bay, which is off of the eastern coast of the United States um, with the state of Massachusetts. Um, as I mentioned, Bay of Biscay there with Spain and France and then Bay of Bengal, which is near India um, as well. Okay. Beach, I won't spend much time because I think we all know the term beach. Um, so beach is just a part of a shore on an ocean, a sea, a large river, a lake, um, washed by tide or waves. So this, I think the key thing here, um, and that may, and maybe not everyone knows, but we have beaches even for rivers and lakes. So it's not just oceans and seas, even though um, you may not, they may not be as popular. Um, it may not be as much of a vacation spot as maybe some of the beaches that you would see on an ocean or a sea, but there are beaches on rivers and lakes. One that I can think of, um, and some, if you've been to um, the United States and in Chicago, um, there are beaches on Lake Michigan, which that's a, a very large lake, but there are beaches on Lake Michigan. So, um, all right, I will pause just for a moment there. Are there any questions so far? No. Okay, great. So next we have Canyon. So Canyon is um, a deep gorge often created by a stream or river. So here we have the Grand Canyon as one of the most popular um, examples of a canyon. And so, you know, canyons are, are very amazing because, you know, due to the river running and constantly moving sediment, which is a, another word for the, the ground and the dirt, um, the rock sediment, moving that sediment along by the force of it and friction going by, um, it creates these canyons um, over, over thousands of years. So here is an example of the Grand Canyon we can see here in this picture. So canyon, very common term. Okay, next we'll go into a cape. And this one um, I want to point out. So a cape 
is a point or a head of land projecting into a body of water. Um, and then we have an example here also in French, or in Spain, I'm sorry, also in Spain. But I want to point out that a cape and a bay, they seem very similar. Um, we actually have the same picture here, um, this top picture. This is of Cape Cod and the Bay of Cape Cod. So the big difference between a cape and a bay is the bay refers to the body of water that could be inside the cape. And the Cape refers to the land. So this was the Bay of Cape Cod, and this actually is Cape Cod. So that's just um, something to point out and to remember when thinking about capes versus bays. One refers to the water, one refers to the actual land. Okay. A cave. Um, cave is another one. It's a hollow in the earth, especially opening more or less horizontally into a hill or a mountain. Um, so several examples of caves um, around the world. I know um, here in the United States in the in the Badlands, so like um, South Dakota, North Dakota, there are several caves there. Um, where I'm originally from in Kansas City, Missouri, there are lots of limestone caves. Now, many of these were man-made, but um, there are limestone caves um, in Missouri. So, um, but caves are something that exist um, throughout the world. All right, a channel. So here, a channel, back to water. It's a length of water wider than a strait joining two areas of water such as seas. So here we have an example of the English Channel. Um, so one thing I want to point out here, and with many of a lot of them denote size. It, 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 it's a, a lot of them are different words based on the size of what you're talking about. So for instance, here we have channel versus straight. A straight, they essentially look the same. They essentially do the same thing, connect to larger bodies of water. But if it's a wider area, it's called a channel. A narrower area is called a straight. And there's many examples of this, such as even we can see here, we have the Atlantic Ocean and we have the North Sea. Both are large bodies of salt water, but oceans are much, much larger, whereas seas are a little smaller. And we will see examples of that throughout this presentation, that many things are dependent on the size of what we're talking about. So, all right. Okay, next up, we have a cliff. So a cliff is a steep rock face near the sea. So here are the cliffs of Mohair in Ireland are enormous. As you can see here, it's essentially a vertical drop right into the ocean. Um, not all areas have these. You know, some, some areas lead into the sea with a beach, um, but others lead into the sea with a cliff. Um, I know um, in, in California, for instance, there are a lot of cliffs on the Pacific Ocean, um, especially in Northern California. There are several cliffs that, um, that have been formed there. Um, and there are probably cliffs, of course, in a lot of places around the world, but that is one of our geographical terms here. Okay, I'll stop again for any questions that anyone may have. And let me know if I, um, I can also slow down a little bit too, if this is moving just a little too fast, but um, if there are no questions, I'll continue on. Okay, so a delta. A delta is a triangular tract of sediment deposited at the mouth of a river, typically where it diverges into several outlets. So here we have a picture of the Nile, which ends in a large delta that empties into the Mediterranean Sea. 
Now, one thing that is um, characteristic of a delta is definitely that triangular shape that is mentioned. The other thing that is very, um, that is usually typical of most deltas is that they are very fertile land. And by fertile, I mean that it's very easy to grow vegetation and other crops, usually on the delta. Because um, so much sediment is deposited there, it has a lot of, it's very nutrient um, dense and nutrient rich because of all the sediment that has been, that has been deposited there. So a lot of times you see um, a lot of agriculture or a lot of um, definitely a lot of vegetation growing in the delta um, here even on this map um, showing the Niles Delta you can see that the whole triangle is green because all of that sediment is growing and, and is very fertile um, the um, Cairo um, in Egypt, it's right in the the Niles River Delta because of um, the, the amount of, of vegetation that can grow there and, and fertile land. So um, that's definitely one of the characteristics that we see in most deltas. Um, another big delta um, in the United States, we have the Mississippi River Delta, which is down, which goes down through Louisiana. Um, and so very most most large rivers um, have a delta in a delta. All right, so next we'll kind of flip the script and we'll go to deserts. So deserts, of course, um, this is a common term, um, a dry area that gets very little rain. So we have here the Atacama um, Desert in Chile, uh, which is actually one of the driest places on Earth. Um, parts of the Atacama Desert have not received any rain in years, any um, measurable rain in years. Um, you know, we also have the largest desert, of course, the Sahara Desert in Africa. Um, but one interesting fact that I would like to um, tell everyone is that, you know, Antarctica, so the continent of Antarctica, that is also actually considered a desert. So many times when we think of desert, we think of these pictures here that are um, covered in sand and very dry, but Antarctica is actually classified as a desert because it receives very little rain or snow. And the snow that falls it just, because of the temperature, it just doesn't melt. So while you may think that there's a lot of moisture on Antarctica, um, it doesn't actually snow very often there, and it is considered a desert. So just a little interesting fact. All right. Next, we'll go on to forests. So a large area of trees. And I think this one's a pretty common, um, a pretty common term as well. And we can have um, regular um, temperate forests, which grow in, in the temperate um, clim climate zones. So that would be kind of um, mid-range, um, not, too, not too far north or south in latitude, but in a mid-temperate range. Um, and you can have tropical forests, which um, we've all, you know, like a rainforest, for instance, um, would be considered a forest. So Yes, a large area of trees. Ah, a geyser. So it's a hot spring in which water intermittently boils, sending a tall column of hot water and stream into the air. So um, geysers are usually found in places which have a lot of... Um, thermogenic activity underneath the Earth's surface. Um, and so that's what um, warms up that groundwater and shoots it up out of the geyser. And so um, there are, in the United States, there are a lot of geysers in Yellowstone National Park. That's a, an area where there you can see some, some big geysers, but these also occur all over the world as well. Glacier. And now this is a slow-moving mass of ice formed by the accumulation of 
compaction and compaction of snow on mountains or near the poles. So glaciers, um, you know, these are very interesting landforms um, because they are slow moving. And that is definitely one of the elements of a glacier is that it moves. Um, and when it moves, it actually tears up in, in basically almost like a... Um, like a big piece of sandpaper, it actually can smooth out and dig up land on the way. Um, for instance, the Great Lakes, um, so Lake Michigan, Lake Superior, those are, were all formed by glaciers. Um, and so glaciers can be very powerful even though they move very slow. And um, Another thing with glaciers, one of the impacts of global warming, which is impacting several um, things around the world, but glacier, the melting of the glaciers is one of um, the impacts of global warming that can contribute to sea level rise um, as we as more and more melt. So very important there. I'll pause once more. Any questions? Any interesting tidbits or anything anyone wants to share? All right, well, I think we'll keep going then. So grassland, a large area of grass covered land, especially used for pasturage. So um, and that word pasturage, um, it, it it's, can be used for grazing of, of cattle or for roaming. Um, even wild animals like the bison and things of that nature can um, roam the grasslands. These words, I will get to a couple other terms, but they grassland, prairie, um, these are both all very, very similar in, in what they – and what they are composed of and how they look. There are some slight differences, which I'll explain a little bit later once we get to the other ones, but grassland, here's one. A gulf, so a gulf is, you can tell by the way it looks, it actually is similar to a bay, but a gulf is a deep inlet of the sea, almost surrounded by land with a narrow mouth. So I think there are two differences that are worth noting between a bay and a gulf. A bay is usually shallower, as in a gulf is, is deeper seawater. And also just the, the forming of the gulf. A gulf is usually, it, it almost closes itself off. So if we think about it as a sea, it almost closes the sea. So as you can see here, this is um, the Persian Gulf um, in the Middle East. See how it just has a very narrow entrance. The Gulf of Mexico, again, this is a much wider entrance, but um, with, with Cuba here, it, it kind of blocks a little bit of that entrance. And so that's that's typically what we have with the Gulf. I'll just kind of breeze through Hill, but Hill is one of those examples of something that's determined by size. So a Hill is a, you know, a, ra a naturally raised area of land, but it's not as high as a mountain. So if something's kind of a smaller mountain looking form of land, it's a Hill. And then we have mountains which are much, much taller. All right, an iceberg. It's a large mass of ice floating in the sea. Um, I think that these, especially in um, the northern areas, there are big icebergs that float in the sea. Of course, um, the term and the popular um, term, the tip of the iceberg, comes from the fact that, of course, um, the iceberg, you only see a very small for a fraction of what the true iceberg is. The majority of the iceberg is actually underneath the water. So um, when we say the tip of the iceberg, that's why, because only the, the top points out of the water, the rest of the mass is all underneath. Island. I think that one's pretty straightforward, so I will um, keep moving for the sake of time. Now, an isthmus, this is actually a kind of a hard one even for me to say, isthmus, but an isthmus is a narrow strip of land with sea on either side linking two larger areas of land. 
So the most famous one, or the the one that comes to mind immediately when I think of this, is Central America, which is kind of the isthmus that connects North America and South America, and even more specifically, the country of Panama, because the country of Panama is a very thin strip of land that really connects the larger pieces. So, um, yep, isthmus. Jungle. This one um, is just an area of land with dense forest and tangled vegetation, typically found in tropical areas. So a jungle is sometimes you could also, for instance, the the rainforest, the Amazon rainforest. That is an example of a jungle. Um, not all jungles are are rainforests or vice versa, but they're they're very similar. And a lot of times they are used interchangeably. Um, but jungle is typically um, a more generic term, where rainforest has some very um, specific. Um, ways that you would categorize something as a rainforest per se, but a jungle is a more generic term um, to be used more widely. I think we know lake. That's also a very common term, so I won't spend much time there. A marsh. So a marsh, it's an area of low-lying land which is flooded in wet seasons or at high tide and typically remains waterlogged at all times. So marshy land, um, marshes, and another thing that this is kind of confused with and a lot of times interchanged, although there is a technical difference, marsh and swamp. Um, so marshes and swamps, the big difference between the two, um, they're both kind of wet, waterlogged, land. Um, but the big difference between the two is that marshes typically have um, not a lot of wooded vegetation, so not a lot of trees and things of that nature. It's more grasslands and smaller vegetation is typically a marsh, whereas swamps are usually, usually have some type of wooded element, almost like a a marshy forest in some if if you want to say that but typically they have more more trees in and that's what kind of separates a swamp from a marsh um if you think about the two so mountains i think this one's pretty um also pretty common um it's an elevation the earth's surface rising abruptly and of course, mountains are higher than hills. Um, and so hills, you know, going around the city, you might see hills, whereas, um, or you might drive over hills, whereas the mountains are usually a much bigger feature um, in the landmass. So we're talking about things like the Rocky Mountains or um, the Andes um, and things of that nature. So, okay. Ocean. I think we pretty much know the larger version of the sea, Pacific Ocean, Atlantic Ocean. Um, so it's just a large mass of that saltwater um, ocean. Ah, a peninsula. So peninsula, this is one that's maybe, I think most, um, this was a little less common, but um, so a peninsula, it's a piece of land surrounded by water except by for on one side. So a peninsula basically is it juts, it shoots out into an ocean or into um, a sea. So if we think about this one here that we can see is um, Baja, California, which is part of Mexico. It is a peninsula. Here we can see the country of Spain, which comes off of Europe as a peninsula. Um, um, in the United States, the state of Florida is a peninsula um, surrounded by water on all sides but one. So there we go. Now, a plain. Here is um, a plain is a large area of flat land with few trees. So again, this is kind of like... It's, again, one of those terms between a plain, a prairie, and a grassland. Um, the difference here between a plain and, let's say, what we talked about earlier, grassland, 
even though they both have very few trees, plains will have other types of vegetation, such as shrubbery, like we can see in this picture here. They're not quite like tall, you know, oak or elm trees, but we do have some shrubbery and some bushes and other types of vegetation can be on a plain, whereas a grassland is predominantly grass and all and, and different types of grass but um it's predominantly grass so even though they're both large flat areas of land that's the small um difference between the two all right a plateau it's a flat area of high ground so here we have you know this is two these are two good examples of plateaus up they can be found um, all over. I know here um, in the United States, a lot of plateaus are in the western United States, um, like Utah, um, Nevada, Arizona has um, those have a lot of plateaus. Um, and so you can see plateaus sometimes around canyons as well. Um, you might have a plateau and, and a, a canyon nearby. So that is um, plateau. And we have C again. Um, so the sea is just a mass of salt water, smaller than an ocean. The Asian Sea, um, the, um, the, Bar uh, the Barents Sea, Greenland Sea, um, the North Sea. We can have, um, so there's, there's seas all over, but they're just smaller. So that's another one of those size, ocean versus sea. One's larger, one's a little smaller. All right, and a straight so a strait is a narrow passage of water connecting two seas or, or, you know, or other large areas of water. So we mentioned strait earlier when we talked about a channel. So as you can see here with this picture of a strait, this is a very, it's a very small, it's not nearly as wide as a channel. So we have some famous straits like the Strait of Gibraltar, which um, between Spain and um, Morocco, um, there's the, you know, the, the Bering Strait between Russia and um, the United States up in Alaska. Um, so these are very small separations of land that we call a strait. Streams, one of those size differences. It's a small, narrow river. So the Taiwan Strait, yes, someone, yes, the Taiwan Strait, also very good. Yep. So we have some straits. So very, um, a little bit narrower than a than a channel. Stream, also, um, smaller than a river. So there can be streams um, in in urban areas. There are streams in forests. There are streams. So they're just a little bit smaller than a river. Tundra. So tundra, it's a vast, flat, treeless, arctic region of Europe, Asia, and North America in which the subsoil is permanently frozen. And another term that's not here, but that permanently frozen soil, we, um, in English, that is called permafrost. Permafrost. And it is... The, the, the thing about the tundra, of course, it's in the northern latitudes, um, so all over Europe, Asia, North America, all of northern or um, very, very southern um, latitudes as well. But one interesting fact about tundra and living in the tundra is that many homes and um, many homes in the tundra or buildings are actually built on stilts. So I know um, if you live in a hurricane region and sometimes you will see homes built on stilts um, to avoid the storm surge if they are right on the beach. Sometimes they're built on stilts. In the tundra, many homes and buildings are also built on stilts because the building sitting on the ground will actually cause the permafrost to melt. And if the permafrost melts, then it becomes very marshy, um, and therefore the stability of the building won't stay sound. So they build them on stilts so that the air can still blow through and keep the permafrost frozen. All right, um, volcano. Um, it's a mountain or a hill, but it has a crater or vents through which lava, rock, fragments, hot vapor, gas are all erupted to the Earth's surface. So um, I think that one's a pretty common phrase as well. 
And of course, Waterfall. I think this is our last one. Um, Waterfall is a cascade of water from a height formed by a river or stream that flows over a precipice. Um, So like the edge, it flows over and down. So many famous waterfalls around the world. We have Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe, Niagara Falls in the U.S. and Canada. So many, many large waterfalls around the world um, there. All right, so I am going to stop sharing my screen early. I'm back in the forest. Uh-huh. There we go. <laughs> um, I'll stop sharing my screen. And um, does anyone have any questions now that we're to the end of the presentation? We have a few minutes left. Um, uh, very simple. <laughs> Let me change it to grid view. All right, my first question is, uh, where can geography teachers find resources for their students? You know, honestly, I am just, I'm always amazed by how many resources you can find online. Even um, you can find present, um, presentations, um, even PowerPoint presentations already created. So really searching for them online, you can search um, geographical terms. If there's something specific you want to discuss, like maybe you want to study maps um, in that part of geography, you can look up um, cartography um, resources, but definitely online is a very is a very good. And yes, I see someone says um, your local library. So always stop by there too um, as a way to get resources and, and, and hard copies of books as well. Yeah, because um, I know geographic, uh, geography teachers will say, you know, we don't know where to find English resources to help us teach our subject in both Mandarin and English. So we need to provide them uh, with resources so that they can they are willing to give it a try. And my second question is, uh, how do your knowledge of geography help you as a person or in your career? I know you were majored in geography in college. Mm -hmm. I did, yes. Um, And I was on the physical geography side, but definitely took courses also in human geography. And I think what it helps for me is just, we all live in... um, we all have an environment that we have to live in and so much uh, and, and we can't we can't divorce ourselves from our environment and so many different things that we do um whether we we think about it or not have to do with the environment we live in. So learning about different places and especially um, learning about the landforms and and even even different boundaries and and learning the history about how even physical land boundaries have affected political land boundaries. It just helps understand um, from a cultural perspective, I think, um, different people. And I, I think you seem to be more interested in human geography. <laughs> Could you <laughs> yeah, elaborate on human geography? How, how can we get started? How can we get more knowledge like that? Yes, you know, it's so funny. Um, I really, I, I did major in physical geography, but I kind of wish I would have done more in human geography because, um, so human geography really covers a wide range of topics, but especially it covers the migration of humans and the movement of humans around the world and the different cultures that developed throughout that movement around the world. And so I think, um, you know, studying and looking up resources online for that, but really studying human geography, I think, it, 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 in our profession as um, English as second language teachers or in or any type of teaching environment where you may be teaching people from other countries or other cultures, having that background and, and, and having some knowledge of where that comes from is, is so valuable. I have more, a much, much more interest in geography more than ever because I'm working with people from around the world right now <laughs> because I'm working with people from 12 different time zones yes. <laughs> and so whenever I got an email I asked them where they live and then I check uh, I check out their place on Google Maps and try to know more about that place mm-hmm. and that kind of 
that establishes a an invisible connection between myself and uh, the, the student teacher from ITA. And then I seem to care more about what, what's happening in their country. Yes. Is this human geography? <laughs> this is. This is human geography. And, and we're learning about the place. Now, from two perspectives, learning about the place, as like you said, um, where they live, you know, what it's like there, that can be more of a physical geography. But human geography and learning about communities and, and how cities are structured and, 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 and that type of thing is more of a human geography topic. And I think to touch on just what you said, I... I'm, I'm the same way when I when I learn of people from different places, and this is weird, kind of geeked. I'm kind of geeked out on this, but um, <laughs> I really like to study like the sunrise and sunset times because I find it so interesting. At different, depending on where you live in the world, um, people deal with a much different variations of how much daylight they get. And for me, I'm very much like a sun person. Like I, the winter time kind of depresses me when I, when we don't have very much sun in the more Northern um, latitudes. And so I'm always very fascinated by that for some reason. <laughs> then you come to Taiwan, especially central Taiwan, because we have sunny days throughout the year. Throughout the <laughs> so we are happy yes. people. And, you're having to, and that's yes. And so far in Mexico, I've noticed that even in the winter time, um, there's still a pretty good amount of sunlight. Um, it's not as it's not as dramatic as where I up in the U.S., where it's definitely a lot a lot shorter. The days are a lot shorter. <laughs> okay. Uh, one more thing before I let you go. Yes. Philip just prints printed out a document from the Department of Education. It's about the training program for teachers who teach other subjects other than English. So they are recruiting school teachers to get the training in order to help them have the ability to help their students uh, know more about the subject, both in Mandarin and in English. And this is very a, a very important policy of our governments because in this uh, nowadays you have to work with people from around the world and so our government is trying to encourage us to learn different languages so that they can work with you know, different people from around the world yeah yes absolutely so okay yeah i love it well, thank you very much for inviting me to do this, and thank you for all the um, observers and, and, and attendees. I hope that this was useful, and definitely reach out to me on Skype if you have any questions or anything like that. Okay, thank you so much for your presentation. I will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. All right, see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.